thank you very much and thanks for coming and uh, giving me this opportunity uh, this is my first time in manila in philippines so a new country and a new set of people also and uh, i'm excited uh, to present in front of all of you what i'm doing um when this kind of a, you know offer came that you know why don't you do something i was finding that you know if i have to talk about a project you know it's like three years project it's not that exciting uh, because you are so close to it um so i thought okay i can if allowed i would like to weave or i would like to narrate a story and what i have done is uh, my story is basically structured in three parts um you are all aware of it but i would like to reiterate that india's urbanization and in specific and in general how is south asia's uh, urbanization is happening in a very different way and it, how it is unique and being an in young country you know it also adds another edge to it another aspect to it so this is the first part of the story the second part of the story is that how cities are governed how we conceptualize it uh, and what is the ground reality may not be the same so what we study in textbook or i study at least in the stick book about municipal governance when i go down the narrative is very different so this is what i would like to share with you my experiences on that and the third part of the story is about the project although it is named as program but it's basically a three year project and it builds on to previous three years uh, experience so it is a project that has just started we are yet not completely conceptualized the, the concept note is still in the iteration process Uh, all the activities and everything is still not formalized or is not being formed up but we know what we are going to be doing but it's not on the paper uh, is in a kind of a flux but then we have a previous 3 years process that we have already gone through and we have a fair idea that what we would be doing next time and then i would uh, end up with uh, the new scenario that has emerged in india uh, i would uh, say everything is new all the time but you know like there is something very distinct that has happened in 2014 may with this new government coming you know all this while it was something very different so i think i would take that as a reference and i would like to discuss that point that how we do our business post 2014 could be an interesting topic to just uh, share that idea with you the people so ma now my first part of the story and um, as you are all urban practitioners or at least from the same field i would not harp on it too much because i would like to show you something else but this entire thing this you know india is urbanizing in situ may be a, a discourse that is understood by us or people who are working in the urban scenario as a um, professionals but this is not the not the popular dialogue that happens still in the conversation it is being always said migration although there are many volumes of paper that has been written that it is because of the natural growth urbanization is happening in india and migration is a smaller factor but whenever you hear anybody speaking they would say people are swarming in from the rural areas and that is there is a migration and then we need to create rural programs so that people do not come so there is a disconnect there and there are reasons for it so this natural growth is not really highlighted and in situ urbanization is something that is not being uh, showcased you know as such um uh, next is this urban population you know this is a, again academicians are very much busy in discussing this whether we are what is the percentage of people are urban urban as such in india the urban definition is very conservative so if depends again you know which definition we are applying Uh, but officially we are thirty one percent. But if we really take uh, the seventy five percent of the male people engaged, you know, that's one of the criteria. If you remove that, we are almost fifty percent actually. So this is something again a definitional issue. Uh, 
definition or no definition something that we need to acknowledge that there is a denial by the administration to accept being urban there is a definitely a denial because of many reasons subsidies tax and other reasons but there is a denial for that um having said all this thing that you know what is um, a point that i would like to make it here is that urban is still not a politically viable like you cannot win a country national election based on urban that is something it does not translate to enough seats in the parliament until the time it is happening uh, it's not really politically viable so that is something that i think one needs to recognize in india it is still uh, politics does not recognize urban for the first time in 2014 may uh, in the bjp manifesto it came quite explicitly so this is something i would say a big change that has happened and which is a um, big thing for urban professionals they suddenly you are being recognized that okay you are important also as a political partner um i take the example of delhi and you know we have never seen this kind of faces in the politics as such he is an irs officer that is a revenue service officer he is a bureaucrat who changed his track and joined active politics now this is something that is also happening there is a new people first timers who are joining politics and they are bringing a completely different way of conducting business and the kind of things that they are talking about is very different from the previous politicians they are no more talking about caste politics they are no more talking about this identity politics or the state things you know they are talking about things like accountability transparency using digital medium you know so these are the new things that is happening which i think is also um you know it says a it's a different way of doing political imagination which is different you know and that needs to be that can be used as a constructive energy also um if you see now the new um, kind of mission mode programs or the centrally sponsored programs that we have um we don't have to go through all this because nowadays um, the new government is very media savvy they want to advertise everything they want to make people know that what they are doing but this kind of things like you know smart cities digital india these are the new programs that is coming up which was not uh you know not the flavor before you know so this is something that has changed and um, they have recognized or they have at least put the finger at the right spot when they say that skill india because it was actually a growth in the gdp without having enough jobs you know the job was not growing so the skill india and make in india is now targeting those kind of niche so what i want to say in this narrative is that there is a change in the context and when we conduct our business we also change ourselves accordingly otherwise i think there would be a uh, you know mismatch in the expectation and uh, what we are delivering now i come to the city governance and my experience of working in cities where i got a chance to work more closer now when the projects are formulated they are formulated with this city as a boundary so municipal corporation urban local bodies you know so that is a term that we are kind of a jurisdiction but urban uh, does not work within the municipal boundary as such so if you see that purple that is what the tirupati city is but if you think of tirupati urban agglomeration that is the entire green thing you know is that so you can imagine you know what tirupati city is in the context of the tirupati urban development area which is so many times bigger than what tirupati city is so the city government or the municipal corporation is actually a quite a uh, small link in the entire thing whether uh, whereas the city government is the elected body and tirupati urban development uh, uh, this uh, agency is actually an executive body so this is where the difference is you know at the local level at the city level the political mileage is actually quite low is the administration which is then ruling at the lower level and the state politics is dominating so whatever we may say that you know that a constitutional amendment has happened and the powers are being devolved to the lower level 
actually it's just on the paper it hasn't really translated in practice as yet and this is one of the gap that i think needs to be worked on in future um this uh, would require a different kind of governance system i think this entire thing of having city centric governance system where the urban local bodies municipal corporations or municipality would be doing work i think needs needs a little bit of rethinking that rethinking has already started and uh, there is a kind of a discussion going on on the shared responsibility how do a cluster of municipalities work together and what would be the governance system that would happen so there is a thinking on that but it has not really crystallized as yet this is becoming more evident when we are talking about transit oriented development where many cities are coming contiguously and then each one cannot have their own government you know so they have to cluster up they have to work together so what would be that form of it um and trying to figure it out how that would have a political identity rather than only uh, development agencies you know so it's not a executive thing but it's a political uh, part of it um cities are growing informally that is actually another point and i think most asian cities are growing informally and this entire thing of this uh, city planning is more for us administrative reason so this tirupati boundary that we see only you know i was bothered about that boundary you know, as a planner for normal people for common people it does not matter you know so they are i think this is something that is a entire thing of growing informally and how informal is being acknowledged or not acknowledged is a big question um you all must be knowing that land prices and the housing prices in india is really skewed you know it's much more than it should be and why this crisis is whether it is being created or that it is a speculation and why that skewness has been you know how we have achieved that skewness is something that has been now being discussed a lot um i think this also needs to be unpacked so we now know the reasons but what we do not know how to tackle it or what are the kind of things that needs to be done to tackle those things so um that's the reason i bring in this governance system again and again that maybe this municipal centric governance system is not working and we need a different governance system to tackle that uh, land issue um something that is happening again is very distinct from before i would say at least 10 years before is this environment becoming a concern i have never seen people or in the national media air quality being discussed so much but in delhi that is i think the next election would be fought over air quality that which government would give me you know fresher air would be the concern so this is now becoming part of the regular uh, news at least you know that uh, how children are suffering because of the air quality this this were not the things that was discussed before water was discussed before but air quality was very intangible that was not part of the discourse as such so this is something uh, i i think is um, uh, an issue that we don't have answers as yet but would happen now this is my third part of the narrative is that inclusive cities partnership program now as you know that we are working now at giz on a very 3 year cycle so most projects are now being structured in 3 years 5 years kind of a um, time span so this has started only in 2014 november um when we started the previous housing program was running at that time uh, for rajiv awas awas means housing yojana and this particular project at the time of the design was anchored to that in may 2015 uh, 14 sorry uh, the same year the government changed and that particular program was then put to uh, you know it was being shelved so we had to wait till june for the new government to announce the new housing program so that we could align ourselves with the new program and then uh, go ahead with it so this is being done with the national ministry uh, the there are two central ministries there one is ministry of urban development and one is ministry of housing and poverty alleviation and this one is anchored to using um, uh, ministry of housing and poverty alleviation um 
this is uh, 3.5 million euro and this is a technical cooperation which means that we only give technical advisory and uh, no money is transferred to the uh, government as such and um, we have just completed the task of realigning ICPP that is inclusive cities partnership program with the uh, new housing program and what we have been uh, doing is that what we have been requested for in the previous program formulation, they asked us not to work on policy. They categorically said, we do not, we know enough to do policy. You don't have to do policy. All you have to give us support in doing implementation of the policies that we formulate. Uh, from 2014, uh, after this government change, things have also substantially changed in that. Uh, now the ministry is quite open and they are saying that um, we are formulating the policy. There are other people who have invited. You please also come, have a look at it and then give us inputs. Whether we take it or not take it, that is our prerogative. But you are most invited and you are, uh, please give us, the, you know, your inputs. I find that also is a um, change as such, you know. So it, we are now working on the affordable housing policy and the rental housing policy. We are also being allowed now to work at the state and the city level which was denied before. We have been asked in the beginning only to work at the national level. And then usually we, whatever we produce, we would like to put it on the, the platform and then exchange on that. Uh, the next three slides that I have, I think is very important. I would like uh, you to just uh, have a, you know, a reflection on this. See, what is uh, interesting is that, you know, what we learned and in the new program, when we start giving inputs, I think there is some kind of a uh, mismatch. See, what we learned from there, that when you go down to the ground, actually there is no demand for housing. What is the demand is for, uh, and I'm, I'm categorically talking about the urban poor section, which means economically weaker section and the lower income group section. Here, the demand was actually, the demand is still today on the basic services, water, sanitation, better connectivity and all those stuff. Housing is not asked for. But then in the last program, we were forced to supply housing. And in this program, again, we are forced to supply housing as a unit, as a tangible unit. And there are reasons for it, which I think all of us know. So we don't need to discuss that. The auto-constructed or the self-constructed housing is again not recognized officially. So in the official records, the auto-constructed housing is not being recognized. What is harped in the official discourse all the time that there is this 18.78 million housing shortage based on certain criteria and we have to do this thing. And this is a huge number of housing that we have to build and for that we need technology and GIZ should then give us some fast technologies. What is not being talked about is that there is 10.2 million housing which is lying vacant, which is there and which is being locked up. And why isn't that particular thing is being unlocked is not being talked about. And most of the housing shortage is in this economically weaker section. So there is a Kundu committee which has said that, you know, 96% of the housing shortage is it's there. So what is happening is something that uh, is... Uh, the housing shortage is in the particular segment and not in the other middle class and the higher income segment. And this is a place where I work and I was part of that project also where we built this housing which got never occupied. Um, another big learning that I have or we have as a team from there is that there is a lot of data. There is no dearth of data. What is not happening is data visualization. And um, when I talk about data visualization, what we got from the municipal corporation of Raipur is an Excel sheet of how many slums that they have. Only thing that we did is that we plotted it onto the city and we get this, uh, you know, this cluster there and then I put this five kilometer boundaries and what we came up with the result that 80% of the slums are where already a sewer network exists because the core of the city has a sewer network and all the slums were concentrated along that sewer network. The moment you have a map like that, what was very easy for us to decide is that let's go for a slum networking approach because 
if we just tinker with the land tenure issue and we can you know manage to get that then solving the sanitation issue was not the problem so we could visualize it and the moment we visualized it the answer was very easy um, but then you know, from excel sheet it doesn't make sense you know it's just we can't come to this kind of a conclusion um, rental housing is another big black box there is no knowledge on it and we just do not know you know how people are most poor people are living on rent but then rental housing is not being talked about uh, housing is conceptualized and that's the reason this housing shortage this 18.5 uh, 3 million figure comes from as a family unit so the assumption is that every married couple would require a house to live in but in cities not necessarily that everybody is living as a family unit with this high mobility nowadays even in hyderabad the city you know which is um, quite prominent now because of this uh, it sector 5% of the population is living in apartment on a bed basis so you hire an apartment you don't hire an apartment you hire a bed so you hire a bed and then you have a common facility and it's around 5% of the population are accessing that kind of a you know accommodation and this is being given by informal sector and i'm talking again about Uh, people who can afford say three to four thousand uh, rent, so it's like a um, um, not so high. It's not the IT professionals, but the normal uh, you know uh, clerk kind of a people. And um, so that is another gap in the housing. That you know housing is being conceptualized as a family, and uh, second is access to credit, because most people are employed in the informal economy, and. It's very difficult to establish their uh, salary. They are not salaried people, so there is no salary slips. So how do you um, establish their credentials? You know that is something. So there are few NGOs who have done very good models, but there are very few. You can just count them in hand. Actually, you know they are just not more than ten, I would say, in the entire country. So this is again a place where one can do a lot of work, which needs to be looked into. the next one is that you know uh, this is very specific to what we have done in india in these two cities so the instrument was um, dpr the um, what you call detailed project report so you make a detailed project report which your city would endorse it would go to the state and then the center would give you funding for implementing that so the cycle of doing the entire thing we took 2 years and by the time we could get the entire thing approved the government changed or something other things changes and even after having the money the municipal corporation does not have enough flexibility to do out of the box in situ upgrading for example you know they can do a greenfield project like the way we saw it you know make this rows of housing but doing in situ upgrading which requires communities engagement and all those stuff uh, municipal corporations are not empowered to do that kind of a work and then there is a disconnect with the community because you are taken the data you have made it you have got it approved and now there is a 6 months of no communication because there is no one to you know keep the fire going and then when you come back again the community does not trust you anymore so this is again uh, something that you know how does one institutionalize it so that things keeps rolling without having this you know uh, snap and um, GIZ had the funding for making the DPR, and once the DPR got approved, we said, "Okay, for us, we don't have any further thing to do now that you have to run with it." And municipal corporation was not having enough capacity to run with such thing, and who would fund the NGO or who would fund the you know other institution who would keep the fire going, and at least uh, do some demonstration work that would keep the uh, you know. things going on and i felt that is something that was not being resolved that if dpr is a mechanism which is a mechanism till now is a tool then what is the cycle you know where does the money flow because by the time the government of india's money gets unlocked it may be too late uh, now the new program um, There, there is an assumption that all slum areas are highly sought after, because you know we always have this thing of 
looking at Mumbai or looking at Bangalore or Hyderabad. Actually, it is not like that. There are 8,000 cities and not 8,000 cities are like having the land price like Mumbai has, you know. So, this entire thing of slum rehabilitation only with a private participation may not work everywhere. You know, these instruments like transferable development rights works in Mumbai. It does not even work in Calcutta. So, it is not something like, a, you know, can be applied everywhere. But there is an assumption that you have to do slum rehabilitation only with PPP and only using land as a resource. So, this is something that needs to be further unpacked. And municipal, I, I would say ministry is right now, you know, very willing to listen to all these viewpoints. What they write on the paper is different, but, you know, at least they are listening to it. Um, the second one is this, you know, uh, promotion of credit linked subsidy. Basically, what they are saying is that we would give a sub, uh, rent, uh, we would give a loan credit and that there would be an interest subsidy on that. Now, to understand this entire thing, you require interfaces. Because the kind of banks we have, they won't be able to explain this thing to the consumer or the end user that, you know, this is the benefit that you have if you take loan from us. Now, to do this, you require a seva, like the self-employment uh, bank people. You require SAAT, which is an NGO who is working on that. You require people like, socialized people like that. And where are those people? And who would nurture them? So, you need other agencies to nurture those kind of institutions who would then become the interface. Right now, there is uh, thinking required and uh, this has to be then, you know, uh, taken forward. Another part of it is this affordable housing with this uh, private-public partnership. I think, you know, there is something that we need to really work on, capacities at both the ends. Uh, we always keep on saying that the public does not have the capacity, but I think to an extent the private also does not have the capacity. And who are the people who can do it is something that I think needs to be, and who then comes and builds the capacity. So that is also the third dimension to it, you know. There's a capacity, but you know, then who comes and builds those capacity also needs to be looked at. I'm, I'm, I would say that there are two more points that I would like to hear say is, one is this rental housing is something that is being not at all looked in India, especially for the urban poor section. So this is something, you know, is a big, gap and that needs to be filled up and the second part of it is that right now the ministry is very active in talking to private developers and this imagination of private developer who is this private developer so the imagination of our ministry is that private developer who is you know registered with Tredai, this consortium of real estate but actually for the people who are supplying housing to the urban poor are petty developers who are not even registered, whose transactions are mostly in cash and maybe not absolutely legal. So, this is this big private developer that needs to be looked at and there is some sort of regularization is required uh, so that, you know, one comes up with housing stock which is at least safe and people don't get electrocuted, which is happening in the, at least the periphery of Delhi, the kind of housing that we are producing. So this is also this private, you know, the imagination of private is also needs to be uh, researched on at least further because these people are working in a completely a grey economy and they don't want to come forward. So however you try, they would not come forward, but I think it's possible to do some surrogate research on that. Um, so with that, I finish this one and um, I, uh, we developed an application for Raipur and uh, Tirupati on slums, you know, how to do their slum data. I'm just wondering if you have the energy to go through this glimpse of it, then I can show it, otherwise I stop there.